Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you, and thanks for joining joining us today. We've got quite a waiting room, and they're all making their way into the Zoom room. So hold tight. We've got a few more minutes before we begin. So grab that drink that you might need. Get settled in. Oh, here they all come. This is great. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Thanks for being here today. All right, well, it's three o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and get started. We have a lot of information to share with you today. And we wanna make sure that we have enough time to get through the presentation, the panel discussion, and most importantly, open it up for question and answer with all of you. So nice to see so many familiar faces. If I don't know you, welcome. I'm Jody Waterhouse, Director of Outreach for the CU Anschutz Multidisciplinary Center on Aging. I am joined by our other co-hosts, um, Danelle Hubbard from the Alzheimer's Association, Kat Laws from the Aspen Club at UC Health. So, and then other panelists will be introduced today. We're thrilled that they could all join us and share their expertise in this very important uh, topic. So it's National Healthcare Decisions Day. So you're all part of the party. Um, which we're thrilled to have you um, as part of the party. So um, uh, get comfy because uh, there's going to be a lot of information um, shared with you today. And we hope that then you can go out and share this information with friends, family, colleagues, neighbors. Um, it's important stuff. And sometimes people don't necessarily talk about this. These are very, very crucial conversations to have with each other. So I wanna make sure that today our um, webinar goes smoothly. So if you can all take a minute and just look at your mute button and make sure that you're on mute. Um, we love that your cameras on are on and encourage the cameras to be on, especially during the panel discussion and Q&A. Um, but most important is that mute button. Uh, you probably have a lot going on behind you and we just don't want um, some noises to, to interfere with the presentation. Also, we are recording today's uh, webinar. If you do not feel comfortable participating in the live webinar and would much prefer to watch a recording of it thereafter, we are going to post this webinar on the Center on Aging's YouTube channel. I will make sure to include the link in the follow-up email after today's um, event so that you have access to that. You also should have a little notice. Um, for me, it's at the top of my screen, but maybe for the rest, it might be at the bottom. If you are in need of closed captioning, you can certainly um, uh, hit that button as well. It looks like mine is on, so just make sure yours is. If you have any difficulty at all, um, you can either message Jessica or myself in the chat and we'll be glad to help you throughout the, the webinar. So uh, we, today's uh, format is we're gonna start with a presentation by Kat Laws from the Aspen Club. We're then gonna move right into a panel discussion led by our very own Dr. Hilary Lum from the Division of Geriatrics. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. 
you are more than welcome to put your questions into the chat. I don't want you to have to think about them for the next hour, hour and a half. So put them into the chat so you don't forget. And then Dr. Lum can refer to those questions once we get to the Q&A portion of today's event. All right, so with that, I would like to introduce Kat Love, who uh, leads the Aspen Club for UC Health. Welcome, Kat. Wonderful, thank you, Jody. Um, I'd also like to draw everyone's attention to a uh, closed caption opportunity uh, in case hearing me is difficult or you would like to see uh, the closed captions as we talk today. Um, on your menu, there should be a closed caption option and you may choose uh, to have those showing if they aren't already for you. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today on this National Healthcare Decisions Day. It's an honor to be sharing with you. And uh, no matter who you are, the interest you have, uh, you are welcome here and belong here. And I'm excited for what will be learned and discussed today. I applaud your bravery in addressing something that most adults prefer to avoid. This topic of end of life and planning ahead um, is uncomfortable for many. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, before I start, I have two questions that get at the heart of our whole event today. There is no need to answer in the chat or, or discuss this, but I want you to think to yourself, um, Number one, do you know who would speak on your behalf if you could not speak for yourself uh, due to an illness or an injury? And second, does this person know what matters to you and how to be a great advocate for you if you cannot speak for yourself? Um, so outside of the many details I will share today, I hope you'll consider those questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and get my slides showing. So hang with me here. These slides will be shared with you in an email with many attachments after today's presentation. Uh, so my contact is here for you. I am a community health educator with the UC Health Aspen Club and we serve older adults in Northern Colorado. Um, I have been doing this advanced care planning for eight years now, learning from local legal and medical professionals and uh, the wealth of information that's available online. We will be sharing those resources with you following today's talk as well. So, I don't know that my slides are advancing. Might try a different screen here. Sorry, everyone. Wanna be sure we're all tracking on the same set of information. There we go. Okay, <laughs> so a little more information about the UC Health Aspen Club. We are a nonprofit free to join health and wellness program uh, for those age 50 and forward throughout Northern Colorado. Um, we provide a variety of health and wellness education opportunities and services. We like to do a lot of evidence-based programming and we are the Medicare state health insurance program for both Larimer and Weld counties. Um, we put out a newsletter every other month, letting you know what activities, uh, events, and services are available. Uh, so if that's of interest to you, uh, know that you would be welcome as a member of Aspen Club. And 
And our agenda for today is to talk through the process of advanced care planning. Uh, you'll get an overview of advanced directive documents for healthcare, and we'll dive into the importance of planning ahead and power of conversation. Uh, bringing people in on what matters to us is an essential step in this process. And there is free assistance available beyond today's program. Uh, so if this is new to you, I hope you'll feel empowered and encouraged to get started on making a plan for yourself and having further discussion with loved ones. So I like this quote, I have an advanced directive, not because I have a serious illness, but because I have a family. Uh, family takes many forms these days. We have chosen family of all kinds, traditional family. I think we can all agree there are those in our life who would benefit from knowing what matters to us and being included on what plans we have in place. Um, this is a process that's available to everyone age 18 and older, so it's not meant to be held off until serious illness or end of life. The sooner we can make and express our plans, our values, our preferences, the longer we can have peace of mind throughout our life that we have a plan in place uh, for a worst case scenario. So what is this advanced care planning? Uh, it is the overall process of learning and self-reflection about what matters to each of us and documenting what matters to us, sharing what matters to us, whether that be with loved ones or medical community, it's important that our wishes be known. And advanced directives are legal medical documents that we do ahead of time to make sure that our voice is known at a time when we cannot speak for ourselves. So those are the, the legal documents that make known our values and preferences. And we'll talk about what documents fall under that umbrella. And this is appropriate for everyone age 18 and older especially in Colorado, where there is no automatic decision maker in place for another adult. I'll be sharing what happens if you don't have a plan in place here shortly, but I want to plant the seed that Colorado is unique in that there is no uh, next of kin specific process in place. So there are a variety of advanced directive documents that apply. Uh, we will be discussing the medical durable power of attorney, uh, the living will, also known as the advanced directive for medical surgical treatment, uh, Colorado Declaration of Disposition of Last Remains, and the donor registry. It is fascinating that at age 16, 18, when we go to get our driver's license, we are invited to participate in advanced care planning by identifying if we would like to be a organ and tissue donor. Uh, and the rest of these documents are largely unknown to us until we do some research ourselves about planning ahead. We'll also dive into some related physician order documents, including a CPR directive and the Colorado MOST form. Uh, so some documents you want to do well in advance, others you address as needed as your picture of health changes over time. And there are many versions of all of these advanced directive documents, uh, state to state. Every state has their own rules and set of documents. And uh, within those states, there's a variety of forms that are acceptable. Uh, in the email that went out ahead of this event, we shared the prepare document, and that is just one example that allows you to accomplish the medical durable power of attorney and has some great questions regarding uh, end of life care, uh, your funeral planning, and getting to the heart of what matters to you, your values and preferences. Uh, 
So you might be wondering where to get started with this whole process. And the prepare document has some wonderful self-reflection questions and it guides you through making a great plan for yourself. I also like to share about the conversation project. They have a variety of starter guides available through their website. They are free to download, available in multiple languages, and they are all about story sharing. They have some great interactive videos and information. They are the host of the National Healthcare Decisions Day uh, event. So when you go to their website, you might see a, a bit about the event that we are discussing today as well. So they have guides for your healthcare agent. They have guides that address Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, so just the variety of reflection that you can do and the ways that these guides help you prepare for robust conversation with your loved ones is uh, worth sharing with you today. So we will spend the majority of our time discussing medical durable power of attorney, the document that allows you to name a healthcare decision maker for yourself. Uh, this is, we believe, the most important form for everyone age 18 and older to have. I mentioned earlier, there is no default as to who can speak on another adult's behalf in Colorado. If a MDPOA does not exist for an adult uh, and the patient is unable to communicate for themselves, the hospital will gather all interested parties and that group of people is expected to come to a decision about a proxy or temporary decision maker for the duration of that illness or injury. If that group of people cannot come to a decision, then it moves on to a guardianship battle within the court system. So all of that can be avoided by having a medical durable power of attorney in place. Uh, through this document, you can identify a medical decision maker who can be your advocate if you cannot speak for yourself in a medical setting. This person has the ability to speak with your physicians, view your medical records, and make all medical decisions that you would otherwise regarding your treatment, uh, the facility where you receive that treatment, um, so there's a lot that this person can navigate on your behalf. So through this document, you are able to name a primary health care agent. That is the Colorado term for your medical decision maker. And uh, the form I typically use allows for up to two alternates. Uh, the prepare form lets you designate a primary decision maker and one alternate. Uh, this healthcare agent might be called on if you are in a temporary situation that makes it so you cannot speak for yourself, or it could be a long-term end-of-life situation. So this agent needs to be prepared with what matters to you and able to speak on your behalf uh, in a pinch. Through any document you choose, a correct phone number is essential. There are many attorney drafted documents out there that don't provide any contact information. And in order for this document to be honored, it needs to be made available and have information that is helpful to medical professionals. So they are able to connect with your decision maker. I like this quote too, your agent is not making decisions for you, they are following your wishes. If we have done our part well to express what matters to us, our agent will be well prepared to speak on our behalf. When considering who could be your healthcare agent, uh, there are some qualities that I encourage everyone to consider. Uh, the only rule in Colorado is that this decision maker be age 18 or older, but you should also choose someone who you trust to carry out your wishes. They understand and will respect your wishes regardless of their own personal uh, preferences. They, they can honor what it is that matters to you and seek the care that, that matters to you. This person should know you well, should remain calm in crisis, 
be able to reassure and communicate with your other loved ones about what's going on. And a great agent will ask many questions and advocate for the treatment that you feel is right. So those are all good qualities of, of who your agent could be. So through Medical Durable Power of Attorney, uh, this document only allows a decision maker to uh, make choices relating to your health care. Uh, a general power of attorney or a financial power of attorney is separate. I do want to make that known. And you can change this document at any time by completing a new form, which automatically revokes and cancels anything you have done in the past. It's important to get rid of past documents so that it, it is clear in your files uh, what form is to be followed. This form does not require witnesses or notary to be valid within Colorado. However, uh, best practice is to get both witnesses and notary if you do travel outside of Colorado. Uh, different states have different requirements when it comes to witnesses and notary. Uh, so having all of that taken care of gives you the most portable document available. So we encourage you complete it properly share it with your loved ones and discuss it. I've had folks in my advanced care planning classes who did not know that they were a decision maker for their neighbor until they got that call from the hospital asking for their input on the patient's care. Uh, so we wouldn't want to put anyone in that position uh, unknowing of, of what matters to us as, as a patient. So that's an overview of the medical durable power of attorney. Uh, I want to also encourage you to think about if there is no one to name as a medical decision maker. You might be thinking, there's no one in my life who quite matches up to those qualities of a good healthcare agent. Um, typically, when I work with folks one on one, we can think deeply about who is in your life that you know and trust. And sometimes that comes from your engagements through your faith community or a hiking group, book club, uh, wherever it is that, that you engage. There are people who want to help and would be honored to serve as a decision maker for you. Uh, there are also folks you can consider hiring. There are care managers, uh, attorneys and others who serve in financial ways who could also serve as a decision maker. Uh, so, so there are options for hiring someone to be a decision maker on your behalf. If there truly is no one to name as an agent or you would prefer to just put your values and preferences in writing and provide instruction to the medical community, you can do that too. Um, so if you go without an agent, my recommendation is to be as detailed and thorough as possible in your documentation of your wishes so that providers can follow through with what you have expressed there. Um, that should include your wishes for organ and tissue donation and any funeral planning that you have done ahead of time. I mentioned the Colorado Declaration of Disposition of Last Remains form early on, and that is a way of letting folks know what you would prefer, burial versus cremation, what type of service you would or would not want. You can also elect a person to take care of those arrangements. So it is a foot in the door with funeral planning, though it does not set you up with a prepaid service or um, way of, of accomplishing that. Uh, so know that that is available. And if you're going without an agent, it's important to be as thorough as possible in your documentation. We'll talk now a little bit about the living will. Uh, this form is only looked at at a time when two physicians agree that there is no hope of returning to functioning on your own without mechanical intervention, and you are permanently unable to make decisions for yourself. 
So this becomes instructions to medical providers about when to discontinue life-sustaining procedures. Through this document, you have the opportunity to allow or deny your healthcare agent the ability to override within reason the instructions you provide. Um, we encourage you provide a time frame and a goal of when it's appropriate to discontinue life-sustaining procedures. There's also a section of the form that addresses organ and tissue donation. It's important that this decision match whatever your driver's license and the donor registry says for you. Uh, the more we have matching congruent information, the clearer it is for our agents and uh, medical professionals to follow through with our values and preferences. This document does require two witnesses to be valid in Colorado, and the notary is optional for this form. Again, we recommend both witnesses and notary for purposes of travel and portability on this document. So just a few highlights on the living will form. Now I'd like to get into those physician order sets that I mentioned at the start. Uh, CPR directive is available for those who wish to avoid a CPR event. Um, this form must be signed by your physician and is active from the moment you sign it forward. Uh, this form does it is different than a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. Uh, those DNR documents are, they come with an expiration. Um, my best example is when you go in for surgery and let folks know that you would not like to be resuscitated in that case. Uh, after you leave the care of that facility or hospital, uh, the DNR expires. So if you want something long lasting, if you're out in the community or in a medical setting and uh, CPR is not desired, then a CPR directive is appropriate for you. Once this is completed, it's important you keep the original on your refrigerator where responders are trained to look for this information. Copies should go everywhere with you and your agents and other loved ones should be aware of this order. Uh, you might also choose to provide a copy and payment to a company uh, through Colorado that provides jewelry, a bracelet or a necklace is available to you. In Colorado, we also have the MOST form that stands for Medical Orders for Scope of Treatment. This form is most appropriate for anyone who's chronically ill, medically frail, their quality of life going into extreme medical interventions is not strong. And this person's focus is comfort. They want to avoid extreme medical interventions. Uh, this form can be signed by a medical doctor, nurse practitioner, uh, so it's a little more open. A physician's assistant can also certify this document. Uh, also true for both the CPR directive and a MOST form, the patient can sign this document or a healthcare agent can sign this on the patient's behalf at an appropriate time. So it's important to consider when uh, in our life it's appropriate to limit medical intervention. Uh, the original should be on this bright green paper and live on your refrigerator for responders to find. Copies should go everywhere. You may also order jewelry uh, if you have this form completed. So advanced care planning is something we should address uh, throughout our life. And we like to think of the six Ds when considering when to review and potentially update our documents. If you reach a new decade in age, what's happened in 10 years that needs to be addressed on our forms? Uh, you experience the death of a loved one. How has that changed any of our decisions or who's involved in our care? If there is divorce, however, after that divorce goes through, your ex-spouse is no longer able to be your decision maker unless you fill out new documents uh, naming them. So know that there is some law in place for divorce. 
If you're given the diagnosis of a significant medical condition, there's decline in your condition or functioning, those are really important times to be sure your documents are in order. You might also consider adding on things like ACPR directive or a most form. If you're departing to another state or country, you'll want to know what's acceptable within that place. Colorado is very accepting of out-of-state documents. So if you have something recent that you're happy with and has accurate current information, uh, go ahead and continue with that. But if you're spending more than six months in another place or moving to another place, you'll want to be sure of, of what's allowed there. And you can check that with a local hospital. So updating is as simple as creating new documents, which uh, take over what you've done in the past. Uh, once you've made new documents, it's important to share those with everywhere you shared originally so that everyone's on board with the changes you have made. So now I have a short video uh, to play that I think gets some ideas going of people's perspectives uh, about sharing what matters to them and encouraging conversation with loved ones. Uh, so I will get that going for you all. Make sure our sound's going to work. Yes, all right. Here we go. There are no guarantees. We None of us know when we might get in an accident, when we might get really sick. Who knows what tomorrow brings? And at least just start, at least just have the initial conversation. Can I get a thumbs up if everyone can hear? All right, thank you. I remember sitting in the basement of the hospital with my parents and screaming like a crazy person because it was very emotional and very stressful saying, I don't know what he wants. I have no idea. What if we hadn't done this? And what if we hadn't done that? Um, what if we had waited another 24 hours? And I think by, by having your advanced directive and giving direction, you're taking hopefully that guilt away from them. It could come up when you're at dinner. It can come up when you're watching a movie at any time. It's a great opportunity to get to know each other better. We may sometimes say, are you serious? Is that really what you mean? And they'll explain, yes, that's really what I want. If something happens to me, I want the doctors to do everything possible. My family knows that I don't want any heroic measures to be taken. I, I don't like pain that much. So I would say as much pain medication as possible. I, I would not want to be a burden on the family. I would like to be comfortable, kept comfortable, and uh, uh, alert as possible in order to be with my family during those last times. I would like to have my choir, you know, come around and sing the songs I we usually sing together. It flows so much easier when the final wishes are documented, they're in place, and the family is essentially with one accord or on the same sheet of music. Welcome the opportunity to have the conversation. Have that conversation. Have a conversation just as a family. I would encourage uh, families to have the conversation. We talk all the time about being close and about being loving, but what does it, act what does it actually mean? When we say, I plan to put my life in your hands, there's seriously nothing sweeter to do. So we're sure thankful to our friends at Honoring Choices Wisconsin for that video. And uh, I'm over by a couple minutes here, but I'm going to pass the torch on to Hillary uh, to guide us in our panel portion of today's event. Thanks so much, Kat, and thanks that um, the questions are uh, starting to come in via chat. So please 
do chat in questions. Some of them Kat will answer directly and some of them I'll bring do, to our Q&A. So with this foundation that we have, with uh, the information that Kat shared, now as uh, part of this time together, we wanted to have a chance to think about how this works out in our real lives here in Colorado. Um, and so as friends, we have gotten together. And so I'll ask first Danelle and then Ilian and then Jacob to each introduce themselves briefly and share a example or story about why advanced care planning is important to them. So Danelle, if you could start us off, please. Sure, thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us today uh, on this just very important critical topic. Um, uh, I'm Danelle Hubbard. I am a social worker and gerontologist, which is a study of aging and older adults. And currently I work at the Alzheimer's Association uh, as the health systems director, uh, focusing on risk reduction, early detection, diagnosis, improving the quality of care for people living with dementia and now supporting building an infrastructure as we move into the era of treatment. So professionally, as both a social worker and gerontologist over the years, um, I've really had the privilege uh, to work with families, primarily those who've been on a dementia journey uh, with this discussion. And it has happened at all disease stages, knowledge levels, uh, sometimes having the discussion um, until it's too late, and how uh, challenging and really heartbreaking uh, these types of decisions can be for families, particularly when someone has a dementia diagnosis. Uh, personally, uh, I'm a current caregiver uh, and I've been in this role as a caregiver for over 20 years now, experiencing chronic disease with multiple members of my family, and also uh, personally looking at end of life uh, choices in my own family and witnessing the impact of decisions that were, or unfortunately, most of the time not made. So this definitely is a, a personal passion of mine, and there is so much uh, that can be avoided and uh, supporting uh, loved ones that just again, uh, as the one said earlier in the uh, video, giving that gift to your family. Uh, and so those are the things that are important to me, and I'll pass it on. Thanks, Danelle. Ilian. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Elian Mino. I'm a senior research assistant at University of Colorado Hospital. And I would like to talk about uh, my experience with advanced care planning with Hispanic patients and their families. Um, I, we, I have noticed that when we have these conversations with our families and the patients, um, I um, found there's different um, essential points that I need to cover during my conversations with them. And I will have to say the number one is a cultural uh, consideration, um, the, definitely the concept of familismo, which is emphasizes the importance of family unity and support. Um, in the Hispanic culture, this, you know, decisions regarding healthcare often involves the entire family, not just the individual patient. Um, the second one, I will have to say is the language barrier, um, providing information in Spanish, using culturally sensitive materials and having bilingual staff help build trust um, and has helped me to ensure that important details are clearly understood and allow more um, meaningful discussions about healthcare decisions with the patient and their families. And the third one I have to say is involving the family members, you know, exploring how to effectively communicate with family members, address conflicts and ensure all the voices are heard um, can significantly impact the success of advanced care planning conversations with the whole family. Um, I have had the opportunity to meet a lot of patients and their family members. And what it makes me uh, most proud is helping raise awareness and provide support for families who might be navigating this difficult conversations for the first time. Um, I want to share a story about a patient that I met a couple of years ago. He is an older gentleman who has many medical 
issues. And when I had the opportunity to talk to him about his future decisions, about his medical care, and if he becomes seriously ill or unable to communicate with his family, um, he didn't know what to do because he felt that his decisions wouldn't count. Um, he mentioned that he has 10 children and the oldest children are the ones who make decisions about what is best for him. So after talking and having this conversation with him, he realized that he wanted to sit down with all his family and have this conversation. And he was aware that he will face difficult decisions when he was when he's close to dead, but having this advanced care planning um, conversations with the family will help ensure that he will be treated accordingly to his values and wishes. So um, that's what it's, it's important to spread the word um, and involve them in this conversations. And I'm just happy to be part of this. Thank Thanks you. so much, Ilian. Jacob. Hi everyone, I'm Jacob Walker. I am a geriatrician and an HIV specialist at the University of Colorado Hospital. So advanced care planning is very important to me in my day-to-day -day career uh, and was doing it with patients just a few minutes ago um, as a regular part of my job. Uh, it's also important to me on a personal level and um, representing the LGBTQ community here for this uh, panel in that uh, when I started medical school, my now husband and I would not have really qualified for some of the federal protections uh, involving uh, access to family, access to family finances, et cetera. Uh, so putting down as much as you can in writing ahead of time can make a big difference when you follow an atypical family structure, as many of us do both inside and outside the LGBTQ community. Uh, so I am thrilled to be here uh, on behalf of my patients and my community. Yeah, thanks so much. I wanted to um, have us have a little bit of a conversation linking to what Kat introduced, but then also um, Jacob and Danelle, what you both have shared a little bit about so far related to um, thinking about care for someone else, maybe being um, a trusted decision maker or thinking about who you would pick um, to be a trusted decision maker. And Jacob, you acknowledged atypical families. Then Danella, knowing you, I know that um, you care deeply about the fact that there can be pretty fractured social networks. We see a lot in the news, a lot about isolation and loneliness. So Danella, I'll start with you. Like, um, how do you think about choosing a trusted decision maker sort of in, in the real world? Um, or perhaps in the context of what might be called aging solo, um, or there are other terms that sort of we see in the, in the newspaper. Yes, uh, definitely. And with uh, choosing a decision maker, uh, first, well, the first thing I actually want to highlight is that um, often uh, families don't do that. They make assumptions uh, regarding uh, who would be the decision maker for the family and they don't uh necessarily take into consideration that uh the the person the eldest is uh traditionally um de definitely in the uh, african-american family as well would be the one making the decisions but they may have their own health issues they may have uh, their own children who uh, require uh more health care they may live somewhere else uh, they also may not be the best fit as a caregiver. This may, uh, those uh, wonderful tips on who would make a good decision maker, it may not be uh, that individual. And so uh, I would say when you are looking at, uh, first and foremost, that person for fit for yourself, I think it's an important. And particularly when uh, you're looking at extended families, uh, you look at families of choice, which I have, it, it becomes a, a little bit of a challenge, but you really have to think about uh, what would be the best decision for myself, for my family, uh, who can move things forward in the way that I would like them to move forward. The other big part of it is uh, in me witnessing others uh, experiencing chronic conditions and pain. Uh, 
that definitely changed my perspective as I've gotten older and revisiting my own wishes and uh, being specific about exactly what I want or not, don't want to experience uh, as the end of life and, and uh, give a, a personal example. Um, I do not uh, wish to be uh, uh, intubated uh, or have those heroics as a, the woman shared earlier, just because of what I've seen in my work and in my role, both uh, professionally and with family. And that is something that I know certain uh, family members, biological family members really would have a hard time and struggle with that for both personal reasons, but also for spiritual and religious reasons. So uh, making sure that you're aware of those perspectives and who you choose and that you have your um, wishes defined and you're very specific with that. Uh, because again, uh, it, it, it may come down to that, uh, that piece of paper as far as how you experience the, the end of your life. And I'll, I'll just echo some of that. Uh, we do see, unfortunately, like I, I see in patients or others, folks who, uh, don't really have anyone they want to be their medical power of attorney. Sometimes that's because they don't have other people they uh, are close to. Sometimes it's because they just don't trust anyone. They've been living their whole life for themselves and they uh, have been making their own decisions. Um, and when I encounter those sorts of uh, people in my practice, I like to frame it as a liberating thing. Um, as Danelle said, with enough documentation ahead of time and planning ahead of time, you can keep calling the shots. If there is no one else to serve as uh, a medical decision maker, you can still be that person. Uh, it just has to be done through writing. So you got to get writing early. Um, the, the other point I wanted to add about uh, folks living with more unusual family structures, chosen families, et cetera, is... Um, one that I like to throw out when there are more contentious family relationships or non-family relationships, which is that you can also name who you do not want to be involved in your care. Um, so if you've got that one relative who you really don't want calling the shots, that can also go there uh, along with the rest of your proxy information. So there are a lot of ways to customize it. Uh, viewing isolation or lack of a proxy as a problem is only half the story. It also creates a lot of opportunity for advocating for oneself. I appreciate so much this conversation we've been having about the who. Now I wanted to hear more about the how. So as you've identified someone that, or some people that you want to um, begin a conversation about what matters to you, how do you bring it up? Um, and Ilian, I, I'd love your perspective of how to bring it up for yourself or in what you've experienced professionally. Yeah, um, it's 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 funny that they think that this is just a topic that is related for older adults, and that's not the case. I always have to bring this up that I um, I consider myself young, but I travel to clinics, to hospitals, and meet patients uh, in clinics, and I'm in the road all the time, and and accidents can happen. So it is important that anyone. Um, the cat mentioned anyone over the age um, 18 and older can have access to this. It is so important. So I think when I use myself as an example that I have something in place and how I talk to my husband in case something happened, um, they realize, oh, it's not just me because I have medical problems. I could be anyone. So it could be my, my kids, my grandkids. So that's, um, I use myself to to start that conversation and, and, and make them feel like also like in, involved in this and how important it is for them to have something in place in case something happens. Anyone else, Danielle, maybe jump in on how you've brought this in and maybe yeah. even particularly like navigating um, mm -hmm. different perspectives. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it's definitely the cows is witnessing the end of life of loved ones, um, but also um, uh, being a part of the Black African American community, acknowledging the historic mistrust of healthcare professionals within my community and, and living the statistics where Black African Americans, we are 
less likely uh, the white Americans to use hospice. We have more emergency room visits and hospitalizations and undergo intensive treatment in the last six months of life. And this is out of uh, John Hopkins' uh, report. Uh, and that's regardless of the cause of death. And so I, um, so to me, that has been my call of action. And I use those situations and scenarios to actually bring up and have that ongoing conversation and ask uh, loved ones, you know, well, what, how did you, what did you think what were your thoughts on um, how uh, the end of life was for that family member or church member or neighbor? And, you know, really what would you have preferred? And, um, you know, one of the things that I would hear in, um, in, in my community is uh, related when hospice or palliative care is brought up, oh, they just want you to die. They, they don't want to spend money on you. They, they don't want you to receive more care. And I think it, it's that type of misinformation uh, really leads to missed opportunities that could provide better end-of-life care. And one of the things that I express uh, not only in my community, but to, to anyone is that hospice and palliative care are options, not permanent choices. So it doesn't mean that you're giving up on that loved one or you want them to die. And that's... Um, a difficult conversation to have sometimes with family members where uh, that grief sets in and they really see, oh, a, a miracle or the spiritual el elements, you know, we're, you know, a miracle is going to happen. This person, they're going to make it through and separating that, um, that no, these are, these are options. You can always decline hospice later, or if it's not working, you can always um, go back to uh, traditional care. So I think in those conversations, that's really how I express, uh, you know, that there that this is an option. And really, again, having that ongoing conversation with loved ones, revisiting it yourself and being specific, uh, and again, making not making those assumptions. Jacob, comments on the how to bring up these conversations? So I, I have a much more boring answer than everyone else, which is as a geriatrician, I see it as like a thing we got to do. So it's time to get your flu shot. It's time to double check that you've got a healthcare decision maker. Um, so I'm a big fan of the practice of just bringing it up on a regular basis, casually, as a thing that just you got to get done like any other uh, chore or task. With my own personal family, I usually use Thanksgiving as that opportunity. So as I'm passing the peas, I just uh, give everyone a quick look, verify they've got a proxy, etc. cetera, uh, see if anyone needs to update it. And that usually goes over pretty well because we can all make jokes at each other's expense. Um, but treating it at as, as, a, as a regular thing, thing that needs to be done to make sure we're all in the best place, uh, I think is is my usual approach. Yeah, thanks for sharing that example. Um, and I acknowledge that that may not um, be possible in, uh, in all settings. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, advanced care planning is a medical term, like we created it in medicine. It's not um, a term in, in uh, uh, life. And Ilya and I wonder, as you've been um, thinking about this topic, what are what are some of the different ways that you describe what advanced care planning is? I think that's instructive for all of us because um, sometimes when we seek to walk in the front door, that can work in some situations. And in others, um, it, it walking in the front door, you're like, we'll find that that door is locked. You know, it just won't be possible. I, I think with the Hispanic patients, um, I have to use a different words um, to help them understand what is an advanced care planning because they think it is a, it is a medical form that they're not ready or that they're scared to know or what they have to do. They're off, oftentimes they think if this is just done right before you get in surgery and that's it. So after you get discharged, that document is no more valid. So um, my experience is just, just not just say advanced care planning, it's just to give a little bit of description of what it is and how important it is. Um, 
and when they understand like the meaning of that is to plan the future um you know they understand and they're like oh okay so I can leave everything in, in writing all my wishes how I want it to be treated how I want it to be if I want to be cremated if I want to be buried so all this um factors that are important for you as a patient so um but you've seen that for the Hispanic patients I have to use different words uh, to explain what it's an advanced care planning yeah I appreciate that tangible example um in probably many of our families, we also don't use the word, in my family, I don't use the word advanced care planning um, and instead try to describe the positive aspects of um, having conversations so that I can know what's important to someone else um, if they're very sick. Um, so I love this conversation that we're having at this point. I want to open it up and address some of the questions in the Q&A. So I encourage anyone to continue to chat in a question. Um, and we'll start with Christine, which is here. Um, Jacob, you said something very um, notable. Um, clarify with enough documentation. And so could you say more about that, <clears throat> especially from um, a healthcare provider's perspective? perspective, like what, what do we mean by enough documentation? Yeah. So many of the documents that Kat went over are pretty limited. Uh, they cover a specific number of scenarios, or they cover uh, just who you would want making decisions for you and who the backup is. Uh, it doesn't tell the reader who might be a total stranger to you uh, what you have been like in life, what your values are, what things scare you, what things you want for yourself if you are ever uh, in the hospital or comatose or what have you. Um, so those documents can only do so much. There is a, a great amount of value in writing things down in more narrative format in sort of a free form. Uh, this is what matters to me. This is what doesn't matter to me. I've had patients hand me uh, just like a bulleted list of the things that are most important to them in life. I've had patients write a short version of their entire life story in one page those types of documents seem uh, almost like a diary or indulgent in some way, but they're really helpful for someone who doesn't know you to get to know you better quickly. That can help guide uh, a clinician or a lawyer or other person helping you prepare these documents uh, in ensuring that we're choosing the right documents, that we are putting the right information in the right places. And if there is still a lot about your own care that you want to communicate that doesn't fit nicely into any of these documents, uh, you can create legal documents out of just about anything. If you get enough lawyers to sign it and it, it looks formal enough, uh, it passes muster and will be useful to people providing care for you, whether that's loved ones or clinicians uh, at the end of life. So there's really no limit to what you can document, even though these particular documents are what we're most familiar with and are somewhat limited. Uh, the sky's the limit on what you can say you want for yourself and people will usually follow it. And I like to think of the uh, the question in terms of people living with dementia, uh, because one of the things we really like to express at the Alzheimer's Association is your quality of life and what do you want that life to look like. So it's well in advance of the later stages. We really want uh, that documented um, in the earliest stages at the at the time of diagnosis, or even uh, if there is a possibility of um, a um, uh, cognitive decline uh, that the person may be experiencing and, and really making that known because it goes a long way for caring for someone uh, living with dementia and making sure they have that uh, good quality of life and uh, their preferences are known. So uh, there are tools uh, definitely on the Alzheimer's Association website, uh, but there are also other tools where uh, it helps you kind of break and, and define, you know, uh, do you want ice cream every day? Uh, do you want a glass of wine at dinner? Is that important to you? And really looking at what matters most, um, particularly as we get older, uh, to you individually and what you want to share with those who will be uh, caring for you in the future. And you're mentioning some um, resources, and I think we'll send some of these out afterwards. Uh, you put in a plug for the Alzheimer's Association. Um, like, tell me, tell us a little bit more of resources online can be kind of overwhelming. So, 
um, what are your top one or two that you might um, give a, if you're in this situation, I like this resource, um, yeah. maybe Danelle and then Ilian. Sure. So um, I, I would say uh, one of the premier resources, uh, because uh, to your point, yes, it can be overwhelming, but we do have something called Alls Navigator that really just helps kind of break down into, uh, I would say, uh, bite-sized pieces of making those decisions, reading about different topics, uh, even uh, specific to dementia, but even not, you know, unspecific to dementia, you could still utilize it as a caregiver of someone living with dementia. The others are actually a uh, helpline. Uh, we have 24 seven helpline that's at no cost and it's almost, it's a no wrong door. So families can call and, you know, share a dilemma. And again, it doesn't even have to be dementia related, but if they have a dilemma or a question, uh, we will get them to the proper uh, community resource. And so I would say those are my two. And uh, the telephone is, uh, I know it's uh, old school, but uh, it's sometimes the easiest to have just a conversation because sometimes you don't know what you want <laughs> or what you need. Yeah, and for um, for me, I use uh, prepareforyourcare.org. It's a great website where that information um, also divides in sections where um, they uh, there's videos. Um, there is a lot of question um, ways to help you how to choose a medical decision maker um, in English and in Spanish. Um, also, uh, some of the forms that are available online for you to print it out a home or your office. So um, it's a great website, um, prepareforyourcare.org. And also it's gonna be a, um, on that email, follow up email to you guys. Um, these are great questions. I also invite, if anyone is not in the place to chat, but are able to um, use the hand raise, then I'd be happy to call on you. So that's where on Zoom it's reactions and then you can use the hand raise or if I can see you, you can also raise your hand and I'd be happy to um, have you state your question um, by coming off mute. In the meantime, um, Danelle, I'd love for you to first answer this. Uh, Barbara asks, how do you have this conversation with a reluctant family member? What is the entry point? How do you keep them from dismissing the whole thing? Um, well, I actually, I like to go back to uh, having questions based on others' experiences and bringing up where it's indirect, if someone is resistant or uh, they just don't want to talk about it, say, well, you know, this is what we observe this is what happened with our great aunt or with our own mother or with our father, you know, how did you feel about that? And, and put the language more in a feeling space versus a, a this is something you have to do. Um, we, you know, we need to know space. And also you really have to gauge that person's um, what's going on in their life at the time as well. And you may not be the person to have that conversation. It may need to be another type of professional. And that's where uh, leaning on social workers, leaning on uh, community-based um, services, leading on uh, spiritual family, uh, all those could be options for, for having the conversation. And particularly if there was trauma uh, related to an end-of-life uh, decision in a family or of uh, that person's spouse, uh, those can be a little more challenging. And sometimes it takes some, someone with skills and counseling to be able to have that conversation. So I would say it, definitely you want to start, but it, you may have to explore different ways to really reach that person um, and, and, and what resonates and who they'll listen to. Thanks. Yeah, big topic. Um, and I imagine that each of us um, could answer that way and that we have our own story of where we've perhaps um, tried to have the conversation and not felt that it went well. And I would just encourage, um, try again, um, but uh, try in different ways and in different times. I'm gonna ask this next question to Jacob and, and I'll even broaden it out. Um, how do you bring up um, this topic with your doctor? And then secondly, um, how can you initiate a question about um, what measures of resuscitation would be helpful or not? Um, 
So Jacob. So there are a lot of ways to tackle this and different doctors might give you different answers. So I apologize in advance, but this is my, my version of it. My first ask on behalf of all doctors is that to really have a good conversation about advanced care planning and CPR, it takes a little bit of time. So don't tack it on to a list of 20 other things that you want to get through to your doctor if it's a busy day. They need We needed a little time to get through it. And so done well should, should take a while. Um, but most doctors should be prepared to handle it in any way that you ask. Like you should not be afraid to ask your doctor about CPR or about advanced care planning. Uh, I think great ways to bring it up is to let them know ahead of time that you want to talk about it. Like, hey, I've got this... Uh, Thing I've never talked to you about before, and we probably should at some point. Can we talk about it next time? Uh, it is also great to ask what they think. Um, if you don't know which way to decide or you're uncertain about your own health, ask the doctor pretty directly for their recommendation. If they're not used to having those conversations, they may stumble through it a little bit, but you'll get an impression of what they think about your health, and that can make a lot of difference. Um, what I would not do is try to sort of tease it out of them. Uh, be direct. When you have uh, a concern, we want to try to help in any way we can. And it's best that uh, we hear it straight from you uh, so that we know it's high on your priority list. Uh, that way, even if we don't have the time to address it in that visit, we might set aside time at a future visit to uh, cover it in as much detail as we feel like uh, you deserve. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, Danelle or Ilian, um, would you also like to share a perspective on this of how you've seen successful opportunities of bringing this up in the context of healthcare? Um, and that could be any setting, not just um, primary care. Well, I would say for uh, the work, I've seen it mostly in actually community based services where. Uh, families do receive a, a diagnosis of dementia and are looking at, you know, what does this mean, becoming educated. And so it, sometimes it comes up in, in an educational uh, setting where uh, someone's learning about what this chronic condition means, what dementia means as uh, the person um will will aid to progress through the disease, that could be the opportunity that the trigger for that discussion and having materials available uh, for families to stand to take a look at that. And uh, there's there's a lot of medical terminology that families aren't familiar with, and it can be very confusing. And the worst time to have an education on what that means is during the crisis when the person is in late stages of, of dementia. And one of the things I um, like for families to do is to actually explore uh, resources around end of life. Uh, have a conversation with the palio team, have a conversation with the hospice um, a team just to learn more and, and to become aware of, of what those options are. So, so again, tr looking at something maybe in an organic, um, setting where the, the topic comes up and, and using that as a way to, to begin that discussion, um, uh, and also uh, circle back to that discussion, uh, sometimes even with physicians, uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, there's something you, you know, you definitely want to have that conversation. Uh, but again, it's, it's when you're ready. It's also a part of, uh, the Medicare annual wellness visit. And, um, that's, uh, the, I would say another opportunity, uh, that is a part of a routine, uh, a routine healthcare that people don't know is a benefit they have, uh, if you are med, if you receive Medicare, so that's be another opportunity to have that discussion. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the annual Medicare wellness visit, and I'll uh, sort of also address um, Cheryl's question. Um, so I think the annual wellness visit might be a time actually when, as a patient, you might expect. Therefore, you know, don't be surprised if you're asked if you've had conversations related to advanced care planning, or you may be asked, um, do you have copies of any documents that you've completed and could you bring them in because we'd like to have them on file as part of your chart? Um, and then yes, Cheryl, the information you put in the chat is correct. Um, Medicare um, is able to reimburse healthcare clinicians um, for advanced care planning conversations. And then similarly, as Danielle said, um, as it could be part of the annual wellness visit. 
Christine, thanks for raising your hand. Um, if you're able to come off mute, would love your question. Sure. So what Jacob said and what Danell said, I'm so glad this could be a part of a, Medi a Medicare annual wellness. This is awesome. Also, when I get things together, I, I want to go to my physician and say, okay, I'm ready to do this. I don't want to have to take a half hour. I, you know, I'd like to take 15 minutes or 20. Does that sound doable if I'm that organized person? Yeah, Jacob. Challenge accepted. Uh, <laughs> I think it's doable if you're prepared, if you know what you want to talk about, if you already know what you want for yourself. Yeah, totally. 15 minutes. I think most doctors could knock that out. If you're someone with a uh, really complex illness who hasn't really thought about it before and hasn't been told a lot about like your prognosis or what to expect in the future, then it's going to take a, a bit longer. Um, but with enough preparation, most doctors will be able to handle that. No problem. And oftentimes I will be referred to a physician assistant. Is that with the approval of the CPR and such, is that well, is that okay? A physician in, assistant. In most cases, and Hillary, correct me if I'm wrong, for the uh, forms in Colorado, I believe a physician assistant can sign off on all of them. That is might not be true in all states, though. And I'd like to. Uh, give a shout out to see you help because that's my provider and they encourage me. They give me a form and each time I go in, they say, have you filled in that form? Have you filled in that form? So I appreciate that so very much. Oh, and I have my, my insurance company, which is called devoted. They send me a form every year as my, for my Medicare wellness. And I get another phone call that says, have you filled in that form yet? So thank you everyone for being here. It It is wonderful to see like insurers and healthcare systems being so attentive to things like advanced care planning. Uh, so thank you all for putting up with the many messages about it if you've received them. Yes, and I think um, one thing that we, you know, in, in the um, chat early on, the question of, yeah, can't, can't there just be one form or how does the most fit into the other forms? And one thing I do regret is that there is a American emphasis on the forms. And I hope one of the takeaways here is that we really want to support conversations that remember who we are as people and our values and what's important to us. And that actually um, this process can be navigated even without forms. Um, forms have a place in the context of um, really appropriate um, conversations between individuals as well as the, uh, members of the healthcare team oftentimes. So thanks so much for the great questions. Um, I think I wanted to ask one more question of our panel and then I'm going to ask our panel also to give final thoughts. So um, and if you want you can do this in, in both. But uh, the question I would ask would be, again, bringing back in our, our personhood. So it's not just about the forms. Um, how do you think um, personal background or culture or values um, should be present in advanced care planning? Like, is there space for the individual in advanced care planning? Um, and maybe we'll go from Jacob to Ilian to Danelle. Is there space for the individual in advanced care planning? Um, yes, I think there is, as we were talking about with um, like writing out your wishes or writing out things more narratively, there's infinite space for individuality in advanced care planning. Where we run into trouble is when that advanced care planning runs up against a, a more rigid healthcare system or runs up into a stranger who suddenly has to make decisions for you that might be uncomfortable, like a, a doctor you've never met. Um, it helps to sort of speak that same language and have a common shared language using uh, many of the forms we've talked about or using uh, many of the terminology we've talked about, uh, but you can insert any amount of yourself into that um, plan. Uh, 
I think for most of us at geriatricians, we have had the patients who have dictated that their funeral wants to be a pink flamingo themed party or that uh, if they cannot enjoy specifically a type of scotch that they love, then it's time to pull the plug. Or if, uh, you know, they don't, they want to be kept alive at all costs until their favorite niece is there to say goodbye. And then they're fine with whatever happens after that. Uh, that individuality comes up all the time uh, in actual end of life care. Uh, end of life care is really complicated. There's so many uh, messy parts and you can bring yourself into every part of it uh, in any way that you want. Uh, it just helps to make sure people know about that ahead of time. I think when um, having these conversations, um, I, when I've been present where the patient is having these conversations with their family, um, their families get surprised what actually really the patient wants as is the wishes and how the patient wants to be treated. And they get surprised because they're like, oh, I thought you wanted the other way. And so this is a great opportunity to, to know what the patient really want and have everything in writing. Um, but it's, it is important for the family to know um, because if they don't have these conversations, I mean, in the end, the families will do what they think it will be the best for the patient. But, but having this conversation ahead of time um, and be me present on during those conversations, it actually makes me happy that they're now communicating better um, they have, they feel more connected. And um, I have a family who say to me, like, thank you, because if it wasn't because of this meeting, um, I could have done something that my mom maybe didn't want this to, to happen to her. So thank you. So, uh, so that's, that's important. And for me, I'm thinking about this in two ways. So the first way is uh, thinking about it professionally and having that uh, cultural awareness uh, when I am uh, working with families and the dynamics of families, and I'm going to say culture in a broad sense, so culture beyond ethnicity, culture related to religious background, culture related to um, how that family uh, has evolved. And uh, there's always the case of the strange child that the end of life wishes have been known everyone's on the same page and someone comes in off the plane and all of a sudden why are you trying to kill our mother why are you trying to kill our father and just being able to to balance and have that conversation and and recognize that in those moments it's about that person's grief uh, not about the medical decisions that are happening and being able to have that conversation and also explain that to the family members who often at that point are very angry that this disruption is happening, but also acknowledging that this is a part of the grief uh, that this person is experiencing for whatever reason. So so I think those, those professionally, those dynamics are, uh, are important to uh, acknowledge and also uh, who you are as an individual, your own uh, personal beliefs and, and uh, decisions that are made that you um, may not, or you may struggle with. I've definitely struggled with uh, some, some decisions I've seen made, but again, going back to honoring that person and the importance in witnessing that of making sure, I was like, I wanna make sure that this is very clear that there's something I don't want or something I do want. Uh, that you know that is that is written and, and and available and shared routinely with people around you, with family, with your loved ones, uh, those who could advocate for you uh, in the um, end of life um, stages or the or dying stages. It's it's emotional and and people behave in ways that you would not anticipate. And so I think by having ongoing conversations and really expressing wishes. Uh, protects both you, you and what you wish, but also it's a gift to your family members because even if they're hurting in their heart of hearts, they hurt what you said. So I think that's, that is also key. Thank you. Um, so 
I'll g give our panelists a chance to give closing thoughts um, or a tip that you hope that our audience will walk away with. Um, and then I'll pass it back over to Jody. Um, Ilian, closing thoughts, then Danelle, then Jacob. Well, I just wanted to say thank you all for being part of this important discussions about, on advanced care planning. Um, remember, by having these conversations and making informed decisions, we can empower ourselves and our loved ones. So that's the most important thing here. And I want to echo that uh, that gratitude and the opportunity to to share both professionally and personally the uh, ex experiences. And um, really, I, I hope this was of help to uh, those on the call today or uh, those who may be listening to the recording and that you don't have to do this alone. There uh, are many, many individuals who are willing to have that conversation and 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 help you with those decisions. And I, I, again, I wanted to reiterate that uh, we don't talk enough about hospice and palliative care. And again, it's not a permanent choice. Uh, it doesn't mean you're giving up, but it is an option and it's really about uh, quality of life and the quality of, of end of life. So that would be my my tip um, is to have that conversation, explore that earlier uh, before there uh, are is a chronic disease uh, diagnosis or you're facing end of, of life decisions. And, and I'll just echo the many positive ways that uh, advanced care planning has been framed throughout this session. There are so many positives here. You can feel uh, relieved at having gotten that out of the way. You can feel uh, glad that you've gotten to know the person you're talking to and having this conversation with more deeply. You can reward yourself for completing some paperwork you meant to get done, patting yourself on the back. Uh, it, the best advanced care plannings are uh, best care advanced care planning conversations are done outside of times of duress and everyone comes away smiling so it can be a really positive experience for everyone that also makes the future experiences more positive as well so it's a win 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 for my book i so appreciate that um this is about having a say in the care that you want um and identifying those who you trust to be involved and that's very very positive. Um, uh, I want to hand it back over to Jody. She's going to give us some uh, final input. What I will say is really, from my standpoint, so appreciative of our panel and all of you for participating. And if there are other topics and webinars that you'd like to have us think about, we would be happy to um, consider those um, because we at the Multidisciplinary Center on Aging really hope to be um, a a source for having these a, a, a space where we can have these types of dialogues. Um, I heard about palliative care, and I know we could have had a whole conversation about palliative care. Uh, Jody. Oh, thanks, Dr. Lum, and thank you to all of our panelists, um, and certainly Dr. Lum for facilitating a great conversation today, and also to Kat uh, for setting the foundation uh, for us uh, to give us a uh, uh, lots of information to ask these wonderful questions that came through the chat um, as well as um, online. So thank you, thank you. This was a lot of information in an hour and a half to be thrown at you, um, but no worries because we have a very comprehensive email that is coming to your inbox soon. Um, included in the email are a number of attachments which are outstanding resources, and many were discussed today during um, uh, the presentation. We've also added a number of links where you can actually click on those links and go right to the websites. I was adding some as we were um, involved in the discussion today, so it was kind of an ongoing email of chock full of information for you all. On there is also going to be the link for the YouTube channel, which we host through the Center on Aging, the video from today. So if you want to go back and watch certain parts because you just didn't quite catch maybe what one of the panelists said or what Kat said, that will be available tomorrow as it just takes a little bit to, to download it and then upload it again. So watch for that after tomorrow. We also have a book recommendation of which we are gonna give out a book to 
um, one of you, um, and it is called The In-Between, Unforgettable Encounters During Life's Final Moments, and that's by Hadley Lejos, and that is in the email as well, so you don't have to, to scurry to try and write down that book title. Um, so before we all depart today, are there any last remaining questions, clarification, suggestions that any of you would like to share um, before we end our webinar today? You can come off mute to ask. Go ahead, Christine. So this, this symbol is the bottom of a heart. So if you say to somebody that you love them or want to kiss them or I'm just so happy, that is the bottom of a heart. Oh, thank you for sharing. That's lovely. Thank you for sharing that. And like Dr. Lum said, we are always open to suggestions of webinars that you might be interested in learning about something in particular. Um, during the pandemic, the Center on Aging hosted over 150 webinars So um, over the two years. So we were busy um, and we have a lot of expertise, certainly on the Anschutz Medical Campus, but across the state. So do let us know if there are areas of topics that you would like to learn more about. We are absolutely open to that. And you all have my email because you received an email to join us via Zoom today. So thank you again. Um, Dr. Lum, will you please pick your favorite number between 1 and 80? Well, I knew this request was coming, so I used a random number generator, and it said 25. Oh, fantastic. So whoever was our 25th participant to register for the, for the Zoom webinar today, I will be in touch with you and you have just uh, won or received uh, the book that I mentioned um, that is also in the email. So yay for number 25. I'll go back and look at how the registration came in. All right. Well, with that, enjoy the rest of your week. Please do keep in touch with all of the organizations that were involved in the panel discussion today, and we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Take care.